Hi, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome to This is Growing Old, the podcast all about the common human experience of aging. My name is Sue Peshin, and I serve as president and CEO here at the Alliance for Aging Research. It's hard to believe that 2023 is over already. As we embark on a new year, we want to channel the lessons we learn and uh, resilience gained into actions that shape a more equitable future. Joining us to usher in the next chapter here at the Alliance is none other than Michelle Marcus, a relentless advocate, expert strategist, and our new board chair. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sue, for having me. That's quite the introduction, but I always find that anything that is involving the Alliance and you specifically is always an honor. So thank you. (laughs) Of course. So in September, you officially became the Alliance's board chair after serving as a member of the board for seven years. What initially drew you to us and why have you stayed? And tell us a bit about your priorities for your tenure as chair. It's so interesting. I was reflecting on this myself, which was the journey to getting to the Alliance. And it was actually from someone we both know and love really well, um, Kirsten Axelson. In her time in government affairs at Pfizer, um, she and I happened to attend a a meeting and a summit together. Uh, We were chatting afterwards and she was talking with such passion about the work that the Alliance does, um, about how much it has uh, meant to her Uh, as a professional and as an individual. And then um, we we got all excited talking about it together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think soon after that, um, I met you and I spoke with Dan and it just became so obvious to me that here was a group who not only was committed to um, their mission and their values as you hope so many organizations working on behalf of individuals uh, is, but was really deeply invested in evolving as an organization and making sure the experience of aging was one that would be accessible to everyone, that that individuals would understand how to thrive at all moments of their life. And I think Sue, you had said something really interesting to me, which is the moment we're born, we are mm-hmm. aging. And that just struck a chord in me because usually we don't think about the experience of aging until much later, until it comes upon us in various different ways. And it's really our responsibility as individuals and responsibility to others as individuals that we think about that much earlier. So um, so right away, I was struck by the personalities and the passion of everyone on it. Um, I could see clearly what Kirsten had meant um, about a strong and mighty and committed group and I wanted in. Uh, that's so. awesome. Just tell us a little bit about some of the the things you hope to accomplish as our chair. I think for for right now, it's really interesting. I've always seen that this is a group, as we mentioned, that punches above the weight of of just the amount of members that it has and the amount of individuals on the team. So as a chair, I just look to help focus that passion, help amplify it, help support the people who are involved um, on the team every day and really draw attention to, in, in, the, in, in all the right ways, all the amazing work that the team is doing and all the impact that they are having. And so anywhere that I can be a support mechanism and a guide or, or an avenue for that, I, I think that that is my main aim. Well, you are, you are hitting it out of the ballpark. <laughs> So thank you. Um, And I am super excited because I'm actually working with Kirsten right now on an abstract for a conference. So we we would be on a panel together and I I hope we get picked. So we'll see. Hope you thank Uh, you. So as head of global markets at Omnicom, you have quite a track record for success in communications. What are some of the communication goals you might have for us here at the Alliance? So what the Alliance has always done beautifully, and I discussed was really impacting the patient at the heart of everything, really keeping that in mind that every single thing, every single initiative, every single issue that is taken on, um, even if when it's not comfortable, um, is helping patients face that, is helping regulators acknowledge that and make changes that are always in line with patients. And I think it's really, for me as a communicator, all about creating 
spaces for important narratives. So, and that's really one of the, the missions and values currently driving the organization. Uh, I think it's so important, drawing more groups in and having deeper discussions, taking up mantles that others won't do because perhaps they're difficult or they're complicated and simplifying them and making sure that uh, the issues are recognized by patients and the impact that different changes and policies are going to have on their lives what they need to be really mindful of that is going to actually um, either negatively or positively impact them. And then calling groups to uh, get involved or make the necessary changes, or quite frankly, pointing out where they're going wrong uh, and making changes that will not benefit patients. These are major communication moments. How we do it, where we do it, when we do it, and with what are a really important communication principles. And then having the, the Alliance recognized for the role of prompting those dialogues, right? It's not easy to always go alone. So how do you bring others along with you? But when you have to go alone, how do you do it in a way that really ultimately benefits the end stakeholder? And that has always been the guiding light of the Alliance. So as a communicator, that's an awesome um, challenge. It's an awesome responsibility. And I think the Alliance has done a beautiful job communicating. I think that my role and my goal um, is to make sure that that continues and again, amplify that as best as possible. Terrific. Yeah. And I, I love what you said about, you know, taking complicated issues and simplifying them. I always, I think a lot of the issues that we get into can be quite complex and really it's a lot of the boring uh, policies uh, in whether it be at a federal agency or at a private payer or, or wherever it is in healthcare that, that can really be the sneakiest, right? And we tend not to pay attention to what's boring and, uh, and it's important to pay attention to it. So the trick of making it understandable and making it engaging uh, is, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting puzzle. And we just really appreciate your expertise in helping us do it. So, well, I um, think what's since they're just on that quick point, I think what's really interesting is they always say, right, it is a notion of if you understand something deeply, you can explain it simply. And I think what the alliance does is try to break it down and explain things simply, even when, to your point, that they're boring, because it's usually the things we don't pay attention to that trip us up the most. Um, right. And that's such a dangerous place to be. And I think that a lot of times different groups overcomplicate things because it's easier to not have individuals understand them. And when right. it comes to aging, when it comes to the experiences and the, the situations people will get themselves into with all good faith, right? Yeah. With thinking through that, you know, someone has their best interests at heart and not realizing that while intense might be great, there's all these complicating factors. And if they don't understand it deeply, they will actually get caught in a space that isn't going to, that isn't going to amount to anything positive. Absolutely. Um, and so you talked about changing the narrative and you did have a hand in developing our new mission, which is changing the narrative to achieve healthy aging and equitable access to care. What, what do you see as some of the main barriers to healthy aging? You know, it's interesting. It's the one of the first barriers, I think, is acknowledging that there are barriers, really and truly establishing that those are true. And that, you know, it's kind of the first the first thing is not denial, right, is is, yeah. is is looking at it in the face. I think oftentimes we like to think that in progress, we are moving past barriers very quickly. Um, but one of the things that is really happening right now is that lack of information or lack of good information, I should say, is creating more barriers than, than really what we can anticipate, expect, or even what we know. It's one of the reasons that individuals are not getting good access to care. And so I think first acknowledging that there are barriers. The second is, again, breaking them down simply so that individuals understand um, and that is a narrative, right, is to be able to articulate what those barriers are, what they mean, and how to move past them, and what some of the solutions are. I think mm -hmm. oftentimes we jump from identification in the world to a solution without deeply understanding something. So any solution that is drawn upon is not well-informed. 
And so we have to have that moment of pause. And one of the things that I think the Alliance's new mission explains deeply within it is going is is really going deep in understanding all of the different individual entities contributing to a barrier knowingly or unknowingly, but also all of the different ways that that problem has to be understood every facet of it in order to be able to really get to a better solution. Yeah, I really like how you said it's like first and foremost, recognizing healthy aging is a barrier, you know, there that there is there are barriers to healthy aging. I think a lot of people see older adults today as the problem, you know, if we didn't have so many uh, or didn't have to pay quite so much in our Medicare program or Medicaid program, uh, everything would be better. And so we approach uh, a lens like that with a, a, a lack of, you know, a lack strategy rather than an abundant strategy. And there's so much I think that we gain as a country by recognizing the value of the aging of the population and, you know, not just sort of throwing people away or seeing them as, you know, an unproductive cost line item uh, that, you know, we, we miss out if, if we don't change the way we view things. So that's, that's I, why I appreciate that we, we added that to our mission. And so in terms of the aging population, what, what does equitable access to care mean to you? So it goes back to, again, getting that, you know, getting care, getting the right information to get care and understanding individ at an individual level what is needed in order for someone to age healthily. Um, I think what you just articulated in terms of the value that that individuals have as they age to society, we tend to interestingly think about that differently as value and productivity. So when someone is working, we say, okay, they're being productive. When they are no longer working in the same way, we don't view them as having that same value. That is absolutely categorically incorrect, mm -hmm. right? The individuals who have the time, the temerity, the life experience in order to shape this great nation come from those who have that benefit of experience. And that is at not only a collective level, but an individual level. And so one of the biggest barriers, I think, to equitable access to care is around understanding individuals at that specific individual contributory level and being able to say, what do they therefore need in order for them to be their best selves, in order for them to be able to contribute to society? And being able to take that very specific approach so that we draw and pull forth as much as possible all of the things an individual can contribute and do. And we tend to think of things holistically instead of at the community level, instead of at the individual level, and be able to say, okay, what do you, Michelle, need in order to be able to contribute and to understand that what Michelle is able to gain access to is different than per another person and another person based on all of their life experience, the situation that they're currently in, and being able to address individuals truly. Without being able to look barriers in the face, we cannot help to address equitable care, and we cannot look at, therefore, drawing forth equitable value. That's and that's right. to our own detriment as a society. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very well said. Um, what do you think is the board, the staffs, partners, partners of the alliances, what's our obligation to the older generation? I think our obligation to the older generation, all of us, and it's incumbent not just on the board, not just on the staff, it's incumbent upon all of us, first and foremost, again, as people, really, is to recognize the contributions that an older generation can have on society to be able to take that and say, that is not a question, that is a certainty. And so if we guarantee that as a certainty, then we can begin to do the great work in order to make sure that individuals have the care and the access to the care that they need in the way that they need it. So the mm -hmm. first thing is we have to understand value is a certainty. Um, mm -hmm. That is our obligation. I look, you know, when we talk about why I joined the Alliance, there's a personal, you know, component to that too. I was deeply connected to my grandparents and mm -hmm. understood them as individuals. My grandmother spent a lot of time in our house. 
um, by the time she was in the, the, you know, final, if you could call that years of her life, but she was a spunky individual. So you never knew, you know, that those are her yeah. final years were many um, and really shaped me as a person through her stories, through her um, persistence. Um, I learned a lot. Um, my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran um, and served in our, our, our military um, and had stories about um, that time, had stories, quite frankly, about um, all of the different jobs he took, all of the different life experiences he took across this country in order to not only support his family, but his country, and then um, pass along those lessons and those learnings. And by the end of his life, um, was still hugely mentally engaged. That man was 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 great at understanding a stock market, um, but you know physically less able to do so. And so I think you know when I think about obligation, I think in terms of what would make them as individuals able to uh, be their best selves mm -hmm. um, and to be able to do all that they did, not just for me as a grandchild, but really all that they contributed to their communities. How do we make sure that my obligation always is to the memory of them and to what they and who they were and what they gave? And so I think if we think back as um, as each of our individual experiences and think about the individuals who shaped us through their direct contribution in our lives, but also indirectly, and we start there, um, then we can actually say holistically, we think the aging population and older generations um, require um, our support, our guidance, our honesty, our, um, our advocacy, right? But we can also think about, if I think of them of an individual level, I can really humanize it. And recognizing that humanity, I can actually put more of myself into making sure they get what is deserved, what they contributed back in kind. Yeah, I, I just want to add something on to that, that because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. You know, we talk about Medicare and Social Security as entitlement programs. And right now, the word entitlement is often used to refer to younger generations feeling like they should get something that, you know, people feel they really haven't earned, right? Trying to grab at something that they haven't worked for yet. But entitlement is really about inherently deserving something um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having a right to something. And when you do work your whole life and you pay into programs, you pay your taxes, uh, you help your community, it kind of goes back to what you were talking about, about what is value. And is it just when you're working or or you know, in traditional cost effectiveness, contributing to society in those types of, of ways. And it's not, it's, you know, there, we created these entitlement programs and it, there was a recognition that you get to a certain point in life and you are entitled uh, to, to have, to be paid back by society for what you have contributed. And so I, when I think about obligation, I, I think about upholding entitlements um, and, and older, or older adults deserve that. And even if they are as a population, like they're doing right now, growing uh, to, uh, you know, to, to a large extent that, that we as a society have to pay attention to, we have to figure it out. You know, it's not, it, you can't really take the easy way out and just say, well, they're not worth it anymore. They've always well, been. It, well, that's so, I love that you you talk about that because what is inherent in that notion of entitlement is a promise, right? We yeah. are promising individuals that as they age, we won't forget them and that their contributions won't be for naught. And what kind of society would we be if we didn't want individuals to age? What, right. I mean, what would that mean in terms of the future that we're trying to build? We talk a lot about building and 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 as we should, for the future generations, but those future generations we hope are going to age healthily and are going to get to a place in their individual lives where again, they are now considered the older generation. That should be the basis of the society is that you, um, you're building something for the future that you can contribute towards that future. But then when you reach your future, 
we recognize that your contribution has been served and continues to serve. I, you know, when I, again, when I go back to my grandparents, when I see all of those around me, when I think of myself, I don't want to be done at a certain age just because I retire. Heck, I might yeah. have more time and more value can to contribute than I did just by, you know, going in and, 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 and into an office and, 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 and working in, in, in my job and my function. All of that, I have so much in me to give. So don't think that individuals, just because they hit a certain age threshold, don't have all of that to give. They have so much to give. I learned so much more um, from individuals who have life experiences that not only provide me with information and with expertise, but provide me with comfort mm -hmm. that there is something to be gained from that life experience that the, it's okay, that things ultimately will be okay because what they've lived through and what they've done and what they've seen um, have manifested in certain ways. I find that so comforting. Yeah, absolutely. And that we're really kind of all the same inside, you know? I mean, that's the thing. I think it, a lot of the perception of burden is fear-based, right? And so when I think about changing the narrative, the importance of doing that, of you know, recognizing the the benefits and the and the and the excitement and the challenges at the same time, but in a way that's problem solving as opposed to how do we get rid, right? Um, and and there's actual research that shows that I mean, probably the biggest factor more than anything else, almost a diet, extra anything else, you name it, that contributes to our length of life and you know how we age it's our attitude towards aging so if you have a negative scary attitude towards it you're not going to age as well so to me it's literally a life and death it's a quality of life issue mm. it's not just a pr thing uh no offense to pr things but <laughs> um it's you know it's 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 real it has it has impact on on people's health and well-being so uh, i think it is sorry incumbent uh, upon us to make sure that if people want to have a purpose that they always have a purpose and so you know to round out i guess the the thought and the the question our obligation is to make sure to the degree that every individual wants to be purposeful and wants to add value, that they can do so to the full extent that their lives can give, or else in a sense, we're shortchanging ourselves and we're shortchanging them um, and what we can derive from the, the specialness of each individual. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that. Okay, so it's a new year with new possibilities. Uh, what are your hopes for the aging population in 2024 on Medicare, Alzheimer's, drug pricing, whatever you want to, whatever you want to pontificate on? Sure. My um, my hope is 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 first and foremost, perhaps holistic and esoteric, is that I would love us as a society to recognize again the value of the older generation. I think it is really a disservice to us that we pit, in a sense, the narrative somehow in the press and somehow in media about younger generations versus older generations. When everything in my life experience, from everything that we see, there is a true benefit to linking those things. Yeah, and absolutely. So first and foremost, my hope is that we move towards a different kind of holistic societal narrative that talks about the red thread that exists between different generations and the value to society that that draws and the hope that that gives individuals who are younger, that they can see a better future for themselves through the eyes of older generations. Mm. So I hope that everything that we do policy-wise, every part of um, what is being put in place for Medicare, uh, everything that we're putting in place for all our different institutions can actually think about that as a goal, is that our job, our goal, our responsibility is to support that coming together and not driving it apart. Yeah, here, here. I love it. Um, I have to, as an aside, I'll send you this afterwards. Australia did this great ad um, that actually shows the age gap. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's it's one of the most brilliant ads I've ever seen on aging. Um, 
Okay, so the, the, we're going to wrap up with two questions that we ask all of our guests. These are uh, favorite questions of ours. When you were a kid, what did you think about growing older? What did you think it would be like? So what's funny is when I've heard this before on um, other podcasts from the Alliance, and I think I'm going to echo some, some of them, but I say, I thought growing older would happen at a different time. Like I pictured myself, you know, when you're 11 and someone thinks about growing older, you think of yourself as 30, right? So yes. <laughs> so um, and, and it I moves thought, up. Yeah. And it moves up constantly. But that's what's amazing, right? When yeah. when you're younger, you look ahead to your, in a sense, your really experienced, happy, you hope better self, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. I thought yeah. I, and, and, and I hope, you know, I'm living that life a little bit if I had to go back in time and talk to my 11 year old self, right? But yeah, I, I if, if you think about that, and that again goes to, you know, the red thread that hopefully exists between the generations, you want as a young person, you want your your experience, your your yourself when you're older, to be thriving, to be happy, to be healthy. I thought I'd go on lots of vacations. I thought, you know, I'd, <laughs> you know, you, you think you'd live more carefree perhaps than you do. You, I never thought of myself as having any illnesses or ailments. Um, and so that's what I, that's, that's what I hoped I'd be. And in a sense, I, I strive for that in my everyday in doing what I'm doing um, mm -hmm. and hope to in, continue to envision myself that as an, as an older adult. Very cool. Well, now that you are an adult, uh, what's the best part about growing older? The mindfulness of it. I think really having uh, the support around me, both in terms of, you know, professionally and personally um, with yourself, Sue, in the lines of being thoughtful about how you age, uh, mentally taking care of yourself and your body, and, and really taking care of um, all of that will protect my future uh, mm -hmm. in terms of making sure that I can continue to age well, continue to be looked upon as someone who has value. I think taking a mindful view of getting older is the most important thing we can do for ourselves and the most important gift we can give to others. Oh, I love that. That's a great way to wrap. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us today, Michelle. It was really a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. So for everybody listening and watching, thank you for joining us. If you're interested in listening to more of our This Is Growing Old podcast, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Have a good one. Take care.